The Everyday Hatred of Men Part 4. Why All This Hate? In this series, we've seen a considerable amount of hatred towards men via patriarchy theory, toxic masculinity, and hegemonic masculinity. Each of these theories openly blames men as a birth group for multiple problems. The system of misery is broad. Academics work to prove that men are inferior. The media portrays men as incompetent and lost. And our educational system teaches a pro-female and anti-male agenda. It obviously leads one to question the ground that might have produced such hatred. I mean, what happened? Let's have a look. One likely factor that made the hatred possible would be gynocentrism, the powerful force that requires the sacrifice of men for the safety, needs, and desires of women. This force has been with us for eons and has been a large part of the success of many cultures. By ensuring the provision and protection of women, cultures had more babies, and more babies is the road to success. Like gravity, gynocentrism is invisible to most. It's present, but nobody notices. Gynocentrism allows women to claim victimhood, minimizes their accountability, and garners support for the denigration of any possible perpetrator, often without questioning the veracity of the accusation. This plays out in many areas, but can be easily seen in its extreme form in the rape accusations of southern white girls who claimed black men raped them. Those men were hung without trial. No questions asked. We see the same dynamic today in our college campuses where our young men are assumed guilty of rape or sexual assault simply by being accused. This is made possible through gynocentrism. Women have been allowed and even blessed to claim victimhood repeatedly. With each claim, the men come forth and work hard to make her safe. We've seen this dynamic repeatedly in our legislatures where women lament that they're tied to the tracks and our white knight legislators come to the rescue. Over and over. Christina Hoff Summers described a similar pattern when she claimed feminists do a study, declare a crisis, and get politicians all worked up. Importantly, there needs to be a villain with any of these claims, false or not. Someone has to be the fall guy, and the easiest path was to blame a man or men in general. Men don't have the gynocentric protection. They're vulnerable, particularly to men in power. All the feminists needed to do was mesmerize the legislatures with their victimhood, and the men in power would do the rest. Not unlike the Southern Rape example. Women have the distinct privilege of the powerful gynocentric pillars that support our culture. It's my opinion that this privilege has been abused by feminism since the late 1960s. This pernicious blaming didn't really get started in earnest until the late 1960s. Prior to that, men were respected. Then second-wave feminism had its beginnings. What most people don't know is that this group of feminists planned from the start to work to destroy the nuclear family and disempower men. They saw the nuclear family as locking women into nurturing roles and minimizing her ability to join the workforce. They knew the only path for women getting easy access to the workforce would be to destroy the nuclear family. In order to do that, they'd need to attack men. What's that? You say you've never heard this before? Well, here, chew on a few feminist quotes. Betty Friedan wrote, Women who adjust as housewives, who grow up wanting to be just a housewife, are in as much danger as the millions who walked to their own death in concentration camps. They're suffering a slow death of mind and spirit. Robin Morgan said, We can't destroy the inequities between men and women until we destroy marriage. Linda Gordon, The nuclear family must be destroyed. Whatever its ultimate meaning, the breakup of families now is an objective revolutionary process. Gloria Steinem, she described marriage as an arrangement for one and a half people. Andrea Dworkin, how can anyone love someone who's less than a full person unless love itself is domination per se? Kate Millett, so long as every female, simply by virtue of her anatomy, is obliged or even forced to be the sole or primary caretaker of childhood, she is prevented from being a free human being. Mary Jo Bain. In order to raise children with equality, we must take them away from families and communally raise them. Vivian Gornick. Being a housewife is an illegitimate profession. 
The choice to serve and be protected and plan towards being a family maker is a choice that should not be. The heart of radical feminism is to change that. Hmm. So it's easy to see that feminists saw the nuclear family as a harness on women. They felt that women could never easily enter the workforce or even do what they might want to do as long as the nuclear family existed. The family was the enemy. It's clear from the quotes above that this was the case, but you never hear a peep from the media or from feminists about this. I've told several people about the feminist penchant to wanting to destroy the American nuclear family, and they all do the same thing. They think I'm crazy and say it's not possible. But folks, it's not only possible, it's the reality. No matter how little you hear about it, the underlying structure of feminism is the desire to destroy the nuclear family and disempower men. We're starting to see that there are at least a few faces to feminism. One face, the one that most are familiar with, claims that feminism is about equality of the sexes. It's the face that the media pushes, it's what you see in dictionaries, and it's assumed to be the truth about feminism. But there's another side that most have never heard about. It's the side that's much darker and much more hateful. Let's go behind some closed doors and hear what went on at a feminist meeting in the late 1960s. This is recounted by Mallory Millett, the sister of feminist icon Kate Millett. Here's what she says. It was 1969. Kate invited me to join her for a gathering at the home of her friend Lilla Karp. They called the assemblage a consciousness-raising group, a typical communist exercise, something practiced in Maoist China. We gathered at a large table as the chairperson opened the meeting with a back-and-forth recitation, like a litany, a type of prayer done in the Catholic Church. But now it was Marxism, the church of the left, mimicking religious practice. "'Why are we here today?' she asked. "'To make revolution,' they answered." What kind of revolution, she replied. The cultural revolution, they chanted. And how do we make cultural revolution, she demanded. By destroying the American family, they answered. How do we destroy the American family, she came back. By destroying the American patriarch, they cried exuberantly. And how do we destroy the American patriarch, she replied. By taking away his power. How do we do that? By destroying monogamy, they shouted. How can we destroy monogamy? Their answer left me dumbstruck, breathless, disbelieving my ears. Was I on the same planet? Who were these people? And they answered, By promoting promiscuity, eroticism, prostitution, and homosexuality, they resounded. That's from Mallory Millett. So even in the 1960s, the goal was not only to destroy the nuclear family, but to go after monogamy and to strip men of their power and role. Does that sound hateful to you? And how would they do this? Listen to what Kenneth Minogue has to say about this from his essay, How Civilizations Fall. He wrote, The first task of this new movement was to create the shared consciousness necessary for tribal functioning. Like all forms of psychic collectivism, consciousness raising, as it is known, exploits indignation and cultivates righteousness. It operated, in this case, with the basic liberatory image of the prison and identifying happiness with being in the labor force argued that only male oppression over the centuries had confined women to the domestic sphere. What radical feminism essentially did was to deny complementarity between the sexes and set men and women up as competing teams playing exactly the same game, but a game in which all the rules were stacked against women. It was only on this eccentric assumption that women had identical talents and inclinations to men that they could support the conclusion that there had been foul play. As with Hitler's appeal to the Aryan race, the basic principle was one of flattery. Women, it revealed, are a marvelously talented set of people who have been iniquitously suppressed by males running a patriarchal system. End quote. So Minogue lays out the game plan. Cultivate righteousness and indignation over the eons of oppression. He goes on to say later that they were also taught, like other Marxist groups, to be docile within the movement while snarling at those without. It's interesting to note that he brings out the necessity for feminists to focus on sameness, that women had identical talents and inclinations to men. Without sameness, many of these differences between men and women, both individually and in the workforce, could be explained and justified. 
This has spawned a flotilla of sameness zealots who bark about the lack of any differences between men and women, even those that are biological. We pointed out this pattern in this series when we discussed the movie The Mask, which worked to create more sameness by having boys be more like girls and force boys to emote and open up in public. In order to make that their sameness claims, they had to deny all of the recent understandings of testosterone and its tendency to push boys and men to strive for status. We now know that testosterone pushes boys and men to strive to be at the top. Denying this might be like a big horned sheep mother demanding her son stop butting heads. Don't butt heads, Junior. Learn to cry and emote. Don't be yourself. Be more like me. This zany push for sameness has, of course, opened up what I call the quota goblins. These goblins push the quotas in the workplace. Since we're all the same, everyone should be represented, or it's just not fair. Again, let's hear what Kenneth Minogue says about this. The feminist demand for collective quotas has overturned this basic feature of our civilization. The crucial point is that the character of a civilization is revealed by its understanding of achievement. European civilization responded to achievement wherever it could be found. To replace achievement by quota entitlements is to destroy one civilization from within and to replace it with another. Wow. So gone are the days of simply hiring the best person for the job. Now businesses are handicapped by the quota goblins to hire for different reasons. Nutty. Thus the ground was laid and soldiers prepared with justifications for their attacks on the family and on men. Just as Millet claimed by promoting promiscuity, eroticism, prostitution, and homosexuality, and by making men the enemy. It doesn't take a genius to see that since the 1960s, they've done just that. Now young women are proud to label themselves as sluts. The term marriage is diluted, and men are seen as woefully inferior to women. It seems that Millet has succeeded with her goals. The feminists started out their second wave with the phrases such as men are pigs or all men are rapists. This progressed to the cultural addiction to male bashing in movies, television, commercials, just about every place you look. There's no question in my mind that the feminist goal to disempower men was key in their initial hateful globalizations about men. Notice that the later male bashing followed the feminist pattern so that feminists no longer have to bash men. Their codependents would do it for them. They have the support of the entire white knight culture doing their job at the expense of men. No one blinks. Also note that none of this male bashing even started until after the advent of second wave feminism. It's easy to see these attacks on all men as being connected to their desire to destroy the family. But were the feminists ever accused of hating? No. I think that gynocentrism is one reason for this, but I think there's more. Think back to the southern town that didn't question the white girl's claims of rape. What was happening there? Why didn't someone in the town speak up? I think it's clear that the entire town was acting in a codependent manner. They all simply didn't ask, didn't question, didn't bat an eye. They just nodded and went home. Their passivity fostered the hatred and the hangings. It's just the way things were. We see the same thing in today's world. The vast majority of people still believe that feminism is about equality and are happy to defend that stance and denigrate anyone who claims anything negative about feminism. These people are actually helping feminists foist the hatred onto men by not calling them out. So it boils down to a minority of feminists who are actually pulling the levers, but they're supported by millions of codependent allies who have no idea of the hatefulness they're fostering. So what we've seen in this series is that feminism is like an iceberg, where the part showing is about equality, but the majority underneath the surface is much darker and more pernicious. The existence of the first three theories should now make a little more sense. Patriarchy, hegemonic masculinity, and toxic masculinity can simply be seen as extensions of the feminist goals to disempower men and destroy the family. It also starts to make sense why feminists have been so negative towards women staying at home with their children. You can encourage moms to stay at home with their kids if you want to destroy the nuclear family. But things are starting to change. Just think about the documentary The Red Pill, a film about men and men's issues which was directed by a feminist. By the end of the movie, the director had seen enough bigotry from the people she had previously followed. She declared herself no longer a feminist. 
Slowly, people are starting to see the hatefulness that's inherent in feminism. This is a huge problem since feminists or their codependents have inundated our educational systems, our bureaucracies, our judicial systems, our legislatures, our entertainment, and of course our media. My view is that all of those who have inundated our systems are spreading millions of microdoses of this hateful agenda throughout our culture each and every day. It's time for us to put a stop to this and cease our codependent support of hatred. Ignorance is no longer an excuse. Like Cassie J., the director of The Red Pill, we need to wake up and declare ourselves humanitarians and work towards fairness for all, not just one sex or one race. If you like this sort of video, please consider supporting this channel via Patreon. Just click the Patreon logo to have a look. And let's not forget, men are good. Subscribe, like, comment, and share, and don't forget to hit that damn little bell to get notifications.